licensed video games. You know what they are. Take something that's a book, movie, TV show, whatever, and slap it on a video game. Some licensed games are well received by the gaming community and go down as classics and staples within their own genres. DuckTales NES, Aladdin, Battle for Bikini Bottom, GoldenEye, Simpsons Hit and Run, The Lego Games, South Park, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, the list goes on. But not for that long. The really good ones are just standouts, and most licensed games, especially around the 2000s, have a reputation for being rushed, cheaply made, boring experiences. The idea is that whoever's buying these games will see a thing they or their kids like and will buy it without a second thought because it's recognizable. Since the companies who make and publish these games are guaranteed a sale based on that, there's no need to do anything super special. I'm not saying they don't try when they make them, of course. That's literally lying. I'd be lying to you if I said that. But you can still understand, if you're making Over the Hedge on PS2, you're not going to be reinventing the wheel for that. And that's not just for consoles. It's the same thing with PC, mobile games, and all other kinds of systems that kids, the audience for these, let's be honest, can get their hands on. If you're a massive franchise, licensing your characters out to whoever, you're going to have games on everything. And that brings us to Hasbro's My Little Pony. 1981 to 2022 nearly nine console generations. That's a lot of games. Are any of them any good? Worth playing? Well, you're gonna find out today because I played every My Little Pony video game. Every single one I could get my hands on in a timely manner. The MLP game lore spans PC, consoles, handhelds, mobile games, browser games, and more. Growing up in the 2000s and 2010s, I've been exposed to every one of these gaming mediums, if you want to call them that. So I think I'm pretty equipped to talk about everything here. In this video, we're gonna go somewhat in chronological order, but there will be a few detours and things I have to lump together so that the video will flow better. Just don't be surprised if we talk about something from like 2018 and then take a few steps back to 2013 and also stick around for the end because I'm going to be ranking these too. And two more things before we start. One, I'm only going to be covering officially licensed My Little Pony games. Nothing fan made and no bootlegs. No fighting is magic slash them's fighting herds. No My Little Amnesia. No Legends of Equestria. No Luna game. Definitely no ban from Equestria Daily. And no Twilight Sparkle Baby Birth Simulator. And two. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Are you lonely? Do you not have many friends? Do you find it hard to talk to attractive people? If you need something to spark up a conversation and make that beautiful vixen in your math class pay you any attention, well have we got just the thing for you. BAM! What's that on your shirt? BAM! What's that sticker on your laptop or water bottle? BAM! What's that on your pin? What's that on your baseball cap? Oh. My. Gosh. Niche internet micro-celebrity Shonks! I love Shonks! And I love you as a result. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, viewers. Merchandise of America's favorite yak is available on redbubble.com. Get this classic design on shirts, pins, stickers, and more. Click on the link in the description below to see all the available products. Wow, thanks, Shunk's Redbubble store. Now all the ladies, men, and other people love me. Results may vary. Shunk's merch does not actually make people want to talk to you. In fact, it would probably do the opposite. Shunk's being America's favorite yak is not guaranteed. MLP has been around since the early 80s, but its first and for a time most popular generation never had any games. No My Little Pony and Friends game on the Atari, NES, Sega Master System, Game Boy. Nothing for My Little Pony Tales either, although I would kill for an awful Crazy Castle game or a Dr. Mario clone on Game Boy with the main 7 slapped on the box. Now, there's a reason for this lack of MLP games in the 80s and 90s. Video games were seen as mostly a boy thing. They were more suited for action, adventure, violence... Things that all boys love, according to 80s marketing people. With that, most licensed games were based on boy properties. Yeah, there were standouts like Barbie or The Little Mermaid, but those aren't as widely talked about. Of course, that's not saying that girls didn't play video games back then, but that's just how things were marketed to kids. Everything was either pink, blue, or for preschoolers. 
There was this one game called Crystal Ponytail by Sega, which is suspiciously close to the 80s My Little Pony, but it's not official. Guarantee you though, this game would not exist without MLP as an influence. So maybe I'll make a video about fan games and bootlegs and talk about it. They even have an evil witch as the antagonist in this? Wow, they're not even trying to hide it. But enough about this Genesis game, because I want to talk about the Genesis of My Little Pony's gaming legacy. It doesn't come on a console, but rather on the home computer. CD-ROM games for younger kids were a thing in the 90s and 2000s. Not super big or culturally relevant back then, but that's more than you can say about them today. These were mostly either point-and-click adventures, or activity centers where you could draw or play mini-games. Some educational, some not. Based on their contents and gameplay, a lot of these were very gender neutral. I can't imagine kids at the time were hardcore gatekeeping Freddy Fish in the case of the missing kelp seeds. Offerings for games had become less gendered, Hasbro had just started up a new video games division called Hasbro Interactive, and they'd also revamped My Little Pony for the late 90s. Seemed like a perfect time to bring MLP to home computers. In 1998, we got My Little Pony Friendship Gardens. The first official My Little Pony game. The game starts off, and we're greeted with a screen where we input our name, age, and birthday. We then get to create our own My Little Pony by naming her and selecting a mane and coat color. We aren't playing as this pony, like a lot of you might believe at first. This game is actually a pet simulator. Once we exit the setup menu, we can give our pony some food, brush her hair, typical pet simulator stuff. Besides that, the object of the game is to get your pony ready to go on an adventure. To do this, you need to go to this town area and explore each of the other ponies' houses. You'll also need to train your pony to jump, but I wasn't able to figure that out, so we're just gonna explore Ponyland. In typical kids' PC game fashion, there are things you click on in the background to make random stuff happen, usually just short animations or having some animals walk by. Nothing out of this world, but it's always a nice touch. Off to the village, and let's start with Ivy's house. Here we can change her hair and dress her up in different outfits. Here you can make her the Queen of England, Ramona Flowers, even Princess Leia if you want. In the dance studio, you can play a pretty easy Simon type game to watch Sundance here do a dance. The games cottage is where Sweetberry and Lightheart hang out. This one room has a ton of stuff to do, but somehow not a working TV. They have tic-tac-toe, coloring pages, activities you can print out. Go to the kitchen over here, and you can decorate the top of a cake. Alright you guys, this is a YouTube video where I customize something in an old video game. I gotta do something really funny for this. After you make your cake, you can either print it out or head over to school, where you play this matching game. There's also a whiteboard where you can make your own pony picture. You can put some text up here as well as classic MLP characters, like Gross Ducks and 3D Scarecrow. For some reason in this, you can't put down stickers of the ponies, only one in the background, so it's either a white page with a pony or a background with random stuff on it. You also can't stack these stickers on top of each other, because if you put one too close to another, the one you put it on gets deleted to make room. Either way, I still think I did good. Maybe I can sell this as an NFT. That's all there really is to do in the game, besides reading letters from the other ponies and taking pictures. There is the jumping show, but I couldn't get that to work. Apparently, to get your pony to jump, she needs to be happy. Based on the walkthrough I found, you literally have to sit there and feed her things over and over again until she does it. Once everything is explored, your pony finally ascends to the Cloud Kingdom above, and you finish the game. Finishing isn't really the point though, since the main draw is the pet simulator aspects and the sweet, sweet printables. I could see this game keeping a kid busy for only a good hour or two. It might not be the most depth or hold up well today, or even compared to other games from the time, but I think it's got a lot of charm. That liminal, pre-rendered 90s PC game aesthetic with this pink girly overtone is really something. Even the loading screens for some reason exude a lot of that. Another thing I want to mention if we're talking about visuals is the animation of the ponies. They look a little awkward at times, but the 2D animation here is pretty fluid. I've said it before, but I would have loved to see how the ponies in this era would have looked in an animated series. I guess the closest we'll ever see to that, officially, is this. As for the music, there are 10 tracks total in the game, 5 of them only being used in the dance studio. For most of the game, you're going to be hearing this same looping theme. It grades on you after a while, but it's so melancholic and soothing, it really adds to the atmosphere this game has. It's probably not the best kids activity center game in the world, but if you have the time and want a small bit of 90s charm, I'd recommend checking it out.
Unfortunately, this game wasn't very popular. The late 90s Generation 2 ponies sold poorly in the US, which would obviously lead to less people wanting to buy a game about them. It's not even listed on the Wikipedia page for Hasbro Interactive's games. Though Friendship Gardens was apparently a flop, Hasbro Interactive still had some success and was even the third biggest video game publisher after only a few years. 90s kids may remember games like Frogger or Glover on PlayStation and 64, etc. Hasbro Interactive even held the rights to Atari in their library of games. This would all come crashing down, however, near the turn of the millennia. Due to reasons that would take too long to explain unless you guys want to hear me talk about the dot-com bubble, Hasbro was facing financial issues around 1999 and 2000. As a result of this, Hasbro Interactive was downsized and then sold off. This is relevant to us because after this buyout, Hasbro had to start licensing their properties to different video game studios moving forward. There's no single studio handling MLP now. We've got a whole bunch of developers and publishers to go through. So why don't we start with that and talk about My Little Pony PC Play Pack, released in 2004. 2004 was around the start of My Little Pony's third generation, which was way more popular than the last. PC Play Pack was published by Atari, now owned by Infogrames instead of Hasbro. I'm guessing the two must have had a good relationship after they bought out Hasbro Interactive along with all their Atari stuff. Development was done by Imagine Engine, a company who mainly worked on licensed games, and who we're gonna see again in this video. Now, the game I played for this could actually be called My Little Pony Best Friends Ball, since that's what it's listed as on Moby Game and other websites, but for convenience, we're gonna call it PC Play Pack. This game was released in a box with an exclusive baby pony. Gonna guess that's where the term pack comes from. There was also a Dora game that was released like this, that came with a little figure, and there were maybe even more like this, but on to the actual game. Choose a pony to play as, and we're dropped into Ponyville. As our pony tells us, it's the friendship ball, and you have to go around and help the other ponies with their preparations, as well as just doing favors. There are a lot of similarities to Friendship Gardens with this. We're given a checklist of things to do, you get to walk around and visit ponies' houses to do activities, and there's even little things to click on in the background, although they're a little more terrifying this time around. Step inside your own house, and you can send out some invitations to the ball, customize your room, or print some stuff out. There are coloring pages, cutouts, and also party instructions. I thought this one right here was gonna be a printout where I could make my own Generation 3 My Little Pony party hat, but I guess it's just a weird text document. Sigh, I guess I'll have to do it myself. You've got three other buildings you can go into. The Cotton Candy Cafe, the Dance Studio, and the Boutique. Dance Studio, you get to make a dance routine for the ball, by dragging moves into these things on the bottom. I actually had a hard time figuring out how to do this, because I wasn't really listening to the narration. There's so much of it, and the ponies stop and pause for so long to tell you things after you do or agree to do any task in the game. Rainbow Dash's disembodied voice from beyond the grave speaks to you for like three straight minutes telling you what you need to do. Anyways, if you're done with your dance routine, you can move on to the boutique. It's another dress-up game, with some more varied options. Why does this pony game from 2004 have more inclusive hairstyle options than most pick room makers? Once you've settled on your outfit for the ball, you can go and bake a cake. You get to pick from a set of ingredients, but it really doesn't matter what you put in here, because when you move on to decorating your cake, it comes out the same no matter what, so you can put cheese, 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 mushrooms, and cheese in here, if you really want. Again, with all these designy things, you can print them out if you want. That's the beauty of PC games like this. Before the internet was as widespread as it was, I imagine these things would be a neat feature to make things and print them out, put them up on the fridge, or do whatever. Aside from the activities, you also need to walk around Ponyville and fetch things for other ponies. Walk up to a pony, they tell you what they need, and you walk around clicking on that thing to pick it up. They're easy like you'd think, but for some reason, finding the last of Minty's socks was impossible before I realized it was under this pony's hoof. This part of the game isn't fun at all, and I can't really see a kid enjoying it either. There's no challenge to getting the object, and like I said earlier, the dialogue is so slow, the exchange between you and the pony you help, Rainbow Dash prompting you to look around for the things, and the exchange when you return them, it adds up to like 5 minutes. Minutes for just the dialogue, it halts you in your tracks. 
To make it worse, you walk around really slowly, and every time you want to interact with another pony or building, your pony will turn around and walk to just the right spot where she's scripted to stand and have the conversation. I wasn't able to make it to the end of this game and see the friendship ball, unfortunately. Every time I tried to save something in the game, it would crash and I'd have to restart. This combined with how slow the game is made it a pretty unpleasant experience. The visuals do have a little bit of that same charm that Friendship Gardens did, but a lot less of it. I'd only recommend this if you actually grew up on it, or G3, and also you'd have to find a way to save your progress. Otherwise, it's a slog. For a game called My Little Pony PC Play Pack, it sure was offensively boring. But don't worry, because this next game cuts out all the walking, and all that, and just gets straight to the point. Pinkie Pie's Party Parade was released in 2007, published by THQ. We're gonna be skipping ahead in time with this one, but only since it was developed by the same team as the Play Pack. This one is a straight minigame collection, with just a menu and a bunch of things to unlock through the story. We open on Pinkie Pie who's eager to play with her friends but forgets that they're all busy on account of the Ponyville birthday party parade, which she also forgot she needed to prepare for. Memory of an elephant on that one. So unlocking the first few minigames has us going around and helping out different ponies with their preparations. First is drawing a picture, and I gotta say, this is the best one of these yet. I know, I would have loved this as a kid. Next is decorating the castle for the parade. This one isn't all that much, just customize the decorations here in a few areas. Next after that is a dancing game with Star Song. It's a pretty slow rhythm game, if you could even call it that. Things will move into this circle and you have to match them to the corresponding icon that'll pop up on screen. There are only two different moves you can do in each round though, so it's really really easy, and there's no penalty for missing any. Another cake making game! This time there's an objective here. You have to match the design of the cake, to this one on the left hand side of the screen. Next is a match 3 game with Cheerily, but it's more of a click 3 since you don't swipe to make any matches, and all the pieces just fall down after you match them. Scootaloo's is the weirdest. Here you throw these things at the clouds, it's not actually based on you shooting it in a certain direction, she throws it in a set path and you can click on the same spot and she'll hit multiple clouds, but sometimes you'll have to aim her up or down, I don't get it. Once you play all of those in order, you unlock the rest of the games. Pony Bowling, a simple bowling game, a croquet game where you switch between each pony after every hit, and Scooter Racing, in this you steer with the mouse and get each of these numbers in order, if you want to get a speed boost. However, the numbers only spawned on one of the tracks for me. After you've unlocked everything, playing enough of each game earns you a piece of a pony poster that you're able to print out. But besides that, you can just do whatever after you're done with the story. Now, about the story. Before you unlock each new minigame, you watch a cutscene with Pinkie Pie and the pony that hosts the game, like the prompts in the PC play pack. These go on for super long, and you can't skip any of them. They just stand there and talk to each other and it's always the same thing. This and Playpack barely had any expression in their models too, because all of these are directly copied from the toys. The only two things they do are flap their mouths open and blink. While it's not the worst thing ever, I don't think Pinkie Pie's Party Parade has that much going for it. The drawing game is a highlight though, and as I said, it's a lot more to the point with its activities. There's no walking around or any real story you have to pay attention to. I really think this game's target audience would get more out of this than they would the other two. Just because there's so much to do, how different all the activities are, and how available they are to the player. Some are more in-depth than others though. And there's not really any stakes for getting anything wrong in any of them, but you know, it's meant for little little kids. Let's move on to the next one and a half games here, with My Little Pony The Runaway Rainbow on PC and Game Boy Advance. My Little Pony Crystal Princess The Runaway Rainbow 2006 GBA slash PC US NTSC was published again by THQ, but developed this time by Webfoot Technologies. Some of you might know these guys for all those Dragon Ball games on the GBA, including the Legacy of Goku series. This game is based off the movie of the same name and follows the story of the Princess Rarity getting lost in Ponyland and having to return to the Unicorn Kingdom in time to create the first rainbow of the season. The game is divided up into chapters, mostly based on locations, Unicornia, Breezy Blossom, Ponyville, etc. Now I'm not gonna lie to you, 
I wasn't really paying attention during most of my playthrough for this, but that's not to say the game is awful. It certainly looks nice. This was the first MLP outing on PC after the Friendship Ball one, and the improvement here is insane. Still pre-rendered, but everything looks super polished and blends together well. There's some nice scrolling in the backgrounds, and even a little sparkle effect when you click on anything, wow. There's a lot of environments in this game, so many places to walk around, and they all look nice, like they're pulled right out of the movie. Again, there's not much expression in the models since they're only based off the toys. That's the same for pretty much every G3 game that uses these 3D models, I guess. The main gameplay is, again, but here you move at a good pace and the mouse controls are responsive. Also, there are arrows pointing you literally everywhere you need to go. Maybe that's part of the reason I wasn't paying attention. I could just watch YouTube in the background while clicking where the big ol' arrow wanted me to click. Between fetch quests and story segments, we get the minigames, the main event. All these PC games skirt the line between being classified as activity centers or minigame collections, and I think this one is most definitely on the side of being a minigame collection. There are just so many of them here. First is Catch the Caterpillar, a game where you blow air to keep this caterpillar up by following him with your mouse and clicking at the right time. Bubble Fight, this one where you just spam the mouse to hit the other pony. Matching Kites, a matching game. Race to the Stars, hold down the mouse to go faster and avoid clouds to keep your speed up. This one and the one where you're on roller skates earlier don't really have any penalty for slowing down or hitting anything, just that you take longer to get to the end. Rainbow Berry Rain, a game where you move from side to side trying to catch falling berries. Dressing Room and Sweet Berry Sundays, like the cake game from Party Parade, but you're matching outfits, and Ice Cream Sundays. Connect the Stars, a game of connect the dots with stars. Breezy Hide and Seek, a non-violent whack-a-mole game where you click on flowers to find Breezy's hiding inside and get points. Rescue Buddies! Click and drop your luggage down to rescue these ponies floating down the river. After you pick them up, some of these guys just drift by again, like what are you doing? Are you just dropping them back into the water off screen after you pick them up? Rainbow Coloring and Picture Pizzazz are similar to everything else, a simple art studio and digital coloring page. Though there are some parts in the coloring page that are so small you can barely get to them with your mouse. These minigames are fun, and they feel more like actual games compared to anything in Party Parade or even the other two. Overall, I think this game is the best of all the Generation 3 PC games. Nice graphics, a full story with different places to explore, and the best selection of games. But what about the Game Boy Advance port? It's surprisingly the same exact game. Story mode, mini games, and all, just on a different system. Less processing power of course, and there's no printables on the GBA obviously, but the handheld version has Pinkie Pie Pinball. So yeah, no contest. On the topic of Pinkie Pie, THQ and Webfoot released Pinkie Pie's Party on the Nintendo DS in 2008. This and Pinkie Pie's Party Parade have very similar titles and cover art, but the games are entirely different, with different stories and minigames. Now, the DS doesn't have a very good reputation when it comes to licensed games. A lot of them are seen as kind of cheap or fall under the category of shovelware. And yes, that's a word I can reclaim. As someone who had a DS, I played a lot of licensed games, mostly Disney, and all of them were fine. The worst it got was either really boring or just confusing. Luckily, Pinkie Pie's party was neither of those. The game takes place on Pinkie Pie's birthday, all the ponies are ready to celebrate, but uh-oh, they can't celebrate because Sweetie Belle hid all her presents around Ponyville. What a good friend. So now Pinkie Pie has to go around doing minigames and helping her friends out in order to get all her birthday presents. It's another minigame collection with walking segments in between. Runaway Rainbow might have had more places to walk around in total, but Ponyville in this game feels the most big and lively it's ever been. Yeah, I know. Not a high bar, but this game accomplishes that. It's only two whole streets in this game, but they pack a lot in there. The art in this game is really nice and was probably pulled from the G3 cartoon, or whatever style guide Hasbro had lying around. Ponies, also I gotta mention, the sprite work on these gals are nice. This is way better than anything pre-rendered on here, or any gross low poly DS models. In Ponyville, each screen you walk past is usually something different and not just grassy town street. You've got trees, gardens, the town square, walls, etc. They even have names for them on the map. 
There are also a lot of areas that you actually get to go inside and hang out in. Except for the Teapot Palace for some reason. I don't know why they dedicated a whole area to it if you can't go inside. Also, why are their ponies blocking the entrance sometimes? Is there something in there they don't want me to see? Talking to ponies in the street doesn't really do anything. They usually just tell you to keep getting the presents. To do that, we're gonna have to play some minigames. You unlock each minigame by following the star icon on the top screen to whichever pony's house you have to go to. Talk to them, and they'll introduce a new game to you that you can play to earn a present. Repeat about 15 times, and you've got all your games. Each pony has around 2 or 3 that you can unlock. Kirli has 2, one where you turn a crank with a stylus, then go run over to water or flowers. The other, you try to plant seeds while avoiding these critters that pop up. Both of these are weird, with nothing really to compare them to. The critter one is kind of like whack-a-mole, but you avoid the mole thing, so it's like passive whack-a-mole. Scootaloo has three. First one, you circle butterflies using the stylus. You can only get one at a time, so it's not as fun as it should be. Another, you race her on a scooter, like the racing minigames from Runaway Rainbow. This one doesn't have any real challenge, since you can speed up as much as you want, and the obstacles on the course here don't give you much trouble. The third one, you clean her scooter off. Wow, Pinkie Pie is really doing other ponies' chores on her birthday to get her own birthday presents. Star Song's games are all music-based. One is the rhythm game with these wind chimes, another similar to Scootaloo's with the butterflies, you have to circle these musical notes for her to play a song, and the third is a Simon style dance game where you repeat these four moves in order to choreograph a dance for Pinkie Pie's birthday party. That last one goes on for way longer than it needs to. Sweetie Belle and Rainbow Dash each have one each. Sweetie Belle you flick the stylus to make this balloon go up and collect balloons for Pinkie's party, and Rainbow's is a shell game where you tap one of these umbrellas to reveal one of your presents. Last is Tula Rula, who has two. One where you decorate a cake, and another where you make a banner for the party. So 13 minigames in total, but you have 20 presents to collect. The rest are either scattered around Ponyville, or spawn after beating a minigame and the map points you to them. I don't think I explained it well enough the first time, but yeah, once you do one minigame, the map could point you to literally wherever in Ponyville. You're not just unlocking each pony's game sequentially, that's why I'm glad they put work into Ponyville here. The music? Also the music. You have different themes based on what area of Ponyville you walk through. After a few games where you barely hear two songs, I feel like this had a lot of variety. Nothing special, but again, it's better than the same overworld theme looping over and over. After finding all your presents, you make your way over the party cake place, and you have your party. The ponies admire your dance, cake, and banner before letting you go and walk around Ponyville freely. In this area, you can also unwrap your presents or do this puzzle over here. You see, as well as presents, there are puzzle pieces scattered around Ponyville that you can collect to make a puzzle at the end. I didn't know this was a frame, so at first I was really confused and thought there were more than 13 in the game and there was like a bug. But once the puzzle is done, it's time to open your presents and 100% the game. That's right, they actually let you unwrap the presents, and there's more to them than just looking. You get these little things you can use with a touchscreen or microphone, like bouncing a ball, blowing a pinwheel to make it spin, turning a music box, even a matching game? Never seen that before. The DS has more types of inputs with the D-pad, buttons, touchscreen, and even the microphone. It seems pretty obvious for any DS game minigame collection to use these, but I was really refreshed because it was a lot different than controlling with just the directional buttons or a mouse. You can flick things, spin it around, circle things. So far, we haven't done that on PC at all. Overall, I thought Pinkie Pie's Party was the best yet. Varied minigames, nice art, music, and a surprising amount of content for something that I thought would just have like five games. Now that I'm done singing the praises of Pinkie Pie's Party on the Nintendo DS, let's move on to our next game. Miss Pac-Man's back, along with four other arcade classics. Just plug it. So, remember plug and play games? Yeah, hashtag only 2000s kids will remember these. Hit like and subscribe if you remember. These were all over the place in the mid 2000s. Simple games that came in the controller, which you'd plug into the AV cables on your TV. A lot of these were based on popular IPs, like SpongeBob, Shrek, Dora, Pac Man, Wheel of Fortune, etc. Like you'd imagine, none of these are anything groundbreaking, but a cool novelty and little blast from the past. The most notable thing about them is the controllers. Some of these look really cool, like I remember really, really wanting the SpongeBob one from Jack Specific. The Scooby Doo one, where it's a little mystery machine, is neat too, and all the Star Wars ones, oh my gosh. But we're not talking about those, unless you guys want me to make a video about that. We're talking about My Little Pony Grand Puzzle Venture, released in 2006 by Milton Bradley. These guys are a subsidiary of Hasbro and only have made a few plug and plays, this, Whack-A-Mole, Backyard Soccer slash Baseball, and some other sports games. 
Included in the box was the game's main character, Puzzleman, and the controller. While not as interesting to look at as the more iconic plug and plays, the controller in this does its job well, and everything on it feels really big and sturdy. The buttons are clicky and satisfying, and the stick is so powerful, like you can just grip it and push it with the full force of your hand. It feels better than a lot of arcade joysticks, or even the joysticks on these other plug and play systems. A lot of them, while neat, usually just end up being a ripoff of the Atari 2600 controller. This thing here is an entirely different breed. This space up here can be used to put a pony if you want someone to tag along on your adventure. It doesn't do anything in the game, but if you want to put one on there, you can. Anyways, let's turn the thing on. First, we have the title screen, and then we get to select our difficulty. Let's go with hard. Surely it can't be that bad. We open on a cutscene, Puzzlement, as we learn. Loves both puzzles and adventures, puzzle ventures, as she calls them. Another pony gives her a puzzle piece, and Puzzlement sets off on a puzzle venture to find the restaurant Ponyland. Here's where the game opens up. You have a small selection of mini games available to you from the start, with more unlocking as you beat each one. The main objective here is to play each game and earn a puzzle piece to put the puzzle together. But there's a problem. The puzzle has nine pieces, and there are only six mini games. I guess you have to play some multiple times, but I did that and still no more puzzle pieces. So, let's just go over the games then. At Twinkle Twirl's Dance Studio, we get to play a rhythm game. Notes float towards you and you press the corresponding direction to hit them. Very, very standard. Next is So-and-So's Closet. This is a fashion game, but it's different from all the others I've done so far. You're given an outfit here and you have to decide what part of the outfit doesn't match up with the rest. Select that part by pressing the button of the same color and get a point. In all these minigames, I've been tested on my visual spatial awareness reaction time, but this one is like critical thinking and, and using context clues. That's cool, but this one was pretty unintuitive. The theme you're given for the outfit is on this calendar on the left-hand side of the screen, which is super small and out of the way. The screen is so pixelated, and the resolution was so bad, I could barely tell what any of these clothes were. Maybe that's my TV is really small and far away from my bed, though? I don't know. I can't really see a kid understanding what's going on here, especially one who can't read all this dialogue or understand what the voice actors here are saying. Next is this flower game with the breezies. It's like the breezy whack-a-mole game from Runaway Rainbow, but instead of clicking, you just use the buttons. Not even the joystick, just the buttons. The colors of the flowers match up with the buttons. If you see one of the flowers shake, press the button of the same color, and some kind of bug or breezy will pop out. Repeat for around two minutes until the game is over. This one was kind of frustrating at first, since the way the flowers are lined up physically, like purple and yellow are on top of each other and red is to the right, where in the actual game, purple and yellow are on the side, and red is in the middle. It's a lot easier if you just flip the controller on its side and play like this. If it was intentional that they wanted me to use it like that, that's pretty cool. This one's okay. No real penalty for getting anything wrong except less points. Same with the other two from this. All the other ones have things you have to do within a certain time limit. Head over to Celebration Castle, and we have a game where you walk around collecting princessy things for Wisteria, like a tiara, fan, ring, cat, pumpkin, frog, if you're playing this on hard mode like I was the first time, you'll have breezies come down and take things from you, so you have to go back to where you found them originally and pick them up again. This one's pretty slow, but I guess if you like maze games, you'll get something out of it. Next is Butterfly Island. Here, you ride around trying to collect butterflies to score points before time runs out. You can only get points, however, if you complete a whole set, meaning you have to look out for the right ones. You're also going to be looking out for obstacles, which slow you down. This one feels the best with the joystick. Steering feels really satisfying compared to all the other movements you do with it. This controller would be really fun for some isometric speed-based game, like Sonic 3D Blast or Marble Madness. Using it for a dance game or a top-down perspective doesn't feel right. You'd want more precise controls for those, like a D-pad or something. The last minigame here is a 2D platforming segment in Unicornia. Here you run around collecting colored ribbons to make a rainbow. Each color has its own meter that you need to fill up, and once you get all the colors, you make a whole rainbow. There's about three levels with you having to make one to three rainbows per level. Colors of the ribbons change sometimes, and black ribbons can show up and take colors from all your meters. There are also these crystals that fill up every meter a little bit. This part is really slow, and the jumping isn't the best. If this wasn't an actual platformer, it would be a valid complaint, but in this game, it's fine. In fact, jumping can be really satisfying if you line yourself up with a big bunch of ribbons. 
make enough rainbows within the time limit, and you're done with this game. Very interesting collection of minigames here. I felt like a lot of them were really basic and at times a little boring. The Butterfly Island one controlled nicely, and I like how the flower one made me think for a second, but the others weren't anything special. The best part of this game was the controller. It looks nice, feels good in my hands, and was fun for some of the games. One last thing to mention is the game's cast. They use a lot of different ponies here from pretty much every G3 special at the time. Wisteria, Rarity, Starcatcher, a lot of these guys didn't even appear together, so it's nice to see them and their little areas unified in one big thing. However, there weren't any references to a very minty Christmas, the best one is you're out of 10. My Little Pony Grand Puzzle Venture is a neat little oddity and a must-have for hardcore G3 collectors. Not much to it but the novelty of having a My Little Pony branded one of these, it's cool I guess. Another thing I want to mention, if we're talking about G3 plug and play games, as I was writing this, I looked up My Little Pony Electronic Game on Google to make sure I wasn't missing anything like a Tiger handheld or Tamagotchi type thing, and I found some listings for this. There's this thing called the Story Reader Video Plus, an educational system that had a My Little Pony game for it. Also a Dora one because of course those two were like neck and neck in the mid 2000s. There's no footage of this and barely any documentation. I would have loved to play this and show it to you guys, but this video is already taking long enough. So I'm just gonna give it a mention. Maybe one of these days I'll play it and get a capture card for my TV so you can see the game in action. But for now all we have is this single screen cap from the box. Let's move on to the World Wide Web. Browser games. If you had or if your parents let you use a home computer in the 2000s and 2010s, you've probably played a few of these, from simple arcade style games to platformers, RPGs, dating sims, puzzle games, MMOs, the big ol' internet had you covered. Although the main program these ran on, Adobe Flash, was shut down, a lot of these have been archived and preserved. Using the program Flashpoint, you can play almost any old browser game that you want. Thanks to these guys, you viewers out there are able to hear me talk about My Little Pony Rainbow Wishes Roller Coaster. Now, you could tell this one was an early browser game. The resolution is so low. This was made to promote a playset of the same name, and when you go look at it, yep. The game plays a pre rendered video of you going around this roller coaster track, and you press the spacebar to collect butterflies as they fly by. The scoring system for this is needlessly complicated. Why do all these numbers matter? Can't I just get a point for each butterfly, please? After the game is done, you're able to print out your score. It really feels like the first MLP browser game. Not much to say about this one, so let's move on to My Little Pony Butterfly Island Adventure. Again, this one was made to promote a playset. You've got a collection of three games where you go and play as Honolulu. You go around the island and collect flowers as well as these butterfly charms. In the first game, the flowers fall from the sky, and in order to catch them, you have to ride a hot air balloon to pick them up. In the second game, you swim and get flowers underwater. You have limited air in this one, but you don't lose the game if you run out. You just go back up to the top for a few seconds. Yeah, if I were working on this game, I wouldn't want to animate a pony drowning either, so I get it. The third and final game is a scavenger hunt, where you click on things to find more flowers. This one was super hard for some reason, some of these things are obvious, but for others you have to click in seemingly random places to find the flowers. I could definitely see a kid getting really frustrated with this part. After the other two were really simple, collect enough flowers, and the game is over. There was more to this than the roller coaster one, but there wasn't much to talk about. Again, all these were free games you could play on the Hasbro website, so for now, don't expect anything super intricate. Like, the games for console slash PC slash whatever were pretty bare bones, but these are going to be even more. We're going from minigame collections to just minigames. Next is My Little Pony Dance Studio. Choose between one, two, or five dancers, make them do moves by pressing the bottom buttons, then record your dance and watch your performance. I call this one FNF Mods Be Like. Friendship Ball and Ponyville Sticker Book, two separate games, but they run on the same engine. These two let you make your own scene by placing ponies, objects, and other stuff. The ponies have little animations once you put them down, some even walking across the screen. My Little Pony Matching Game, a matching game with the G3 ponies. Alright, now let's move on to the Core 7 era of Generation 3. 
This was when Hasbro basically ignored the rest of the cast to focus on these seven ponies. This era of G3 had its own website with videos to watch and activities to do. The site was structured like Ponyville, where you could click around, talk to ponies, and go inside buildings. I ran into a problem with this one where none of the text loads, and you can't leave a building once you go inside and none of the activities load. So let's just move on to G3.5. Yet another version of G3, they keep the Core 7 here, but everything is redesigned. Bigger heads, eyes, hooves. The first G3.5 game I came across is this family scrapbook, a hub for some pony themed activities. Typical stuff like decorating a cupcake with Sweetie Belle, dressing up a Rainbow Dash, coloring with Tula Rula, and Pinkie Pie puzzles. There's also this Mad Libs thing with Cheerilee and Scootaloo, and a sing along to a few G3 tunes. None of the catchy ones though, like where's the Ladybug song, the best one? Alright, we're gonna get to the stuff that you guys have been waiting for. My Little Pony Generation 4, arguably the most popular and successful version of MLP. After this show came out, this is what people think of when they hear My Little Pony. Now, G4 was really popular, but it never got an official console game. This is really weird considering how bronies were a thing. Adult men with the money to spend on all things related to MLP, including video games. The brony fandom also had a pretty big overlap with the gaming community, and even without that, Friendship is Magic was big enough in regular toy sales that a game on the 3DS, Wii U, or any other home console slash handheld would have been a solid investment for Hasbro. There was one thing physically released on a handheld, but I don't think we'll be talking about that right now. That's not to say that G4 didn't have any games at all, there were a ton of browser games, from Hasbro and the Hub Network's websites, as well as mobile games. Just like the G3 games, the earliest G4 browser games weren't that exciting. Here we have My Little Pony Card Creator and My Little Pony Castle Creator. You can tell these were early because of the hub logo in the corner with the TV listings option. I couldn't get the card one to load and the castle one didn't work at all. But if you watch a video of it online, you'll get the idea. Drag and drop ponies onto a thing and print it out if you want. Before we go any further here, there are two fan made ones I need to talk about. I know I said this video would be on official MLP games, but it's for a good reason. Despite looking official, Pink Tac Toe and Explore Ponyville were made by fans. So no comments being like, surprised you didn't mention this, when it's not real. It's not real. There's one more I found called My Little Pony Place. It feels very real, but there's no copyright notice, nor do they use the official logo and all the fonts are like default system fonts. This could be one of the many bootleg MLP browser games out there trying to disguise itself as something original. Now here's a pretty well known one, Adventures in Ponyville. Coming up, we're going to see a lot of G4 games with a custom pony maker, this being one of them. Here we have the first of many official MLP character creators. You can change the hair, eyes, as well as adding some clothes, but there's a lot of stuff you have to unlock. Let's get into the game. The object here is to earn points by playing minigames and to level up your friendship meters here at the top of the screen. The meters you fill up by doing certain things in the minigames, and you can also do these little friendship lessons by clicking on these other ponies that walk around. They'll tell you a problem they have, and whichever answer you pick earns you friendship points in a certain category. There are three minigames here. Apple bucking, cloud busting, and packing sweets at Sugar Cube Corner. Each of these all have a cutscene at the beginning that explains the scenario, and the games go on until you mess up enough times and run out of energy. Because of that second thing, these games can go on for a long time. The Sugar Cube Corner one gets faster as it goes on, which makes me run out of energy more, but the other two I just get tired of after like 5 minutes and I decide not to try anymore. And it's the same thing over and over again, they never change it up at all. Go up and down to bust clouds, click on apple trees to buck them, and take the apples back to the cart, drag the sweets onto the box with the right silhouette. Dude, Quastunkle is tired of this, she wants to leave. And in the Pony Maker, you need so many points to unlock the extra cosmetics. I'd be here for 8 hours if I wanted to 100% this game, and the minigames aren't varied or fun enough for me to want to spend more time in this. I need something more fast paced, like racing is magic. In this one, all the ponies are having a race across Equestria. Pick from a member of each pony race and relay through Sweet Apple Acres, the Sky, and the Everfree Forest. The first and last stages are a platformer, with the Sky one giving you the ability to move up and down. But they all have the same basic mechanics. Rings give you a speed boost, and apples give you more energy, though it's unclear what that does. Run or fly through the level and try to beat your best time. Each level you get a potion that lets you bypass an unbeatable obstacle, but those never seem to work for me, so I just had to deal with that or glitch through. 
Between each level of the race, there's also a very simple minigame you can play for more points. Honestly, I could see my younger self really enjoying this game. Flash games based on shows that just take assets from them is a really nostalgic thing for me. Reminds me of a lot of the games from the old Cartoon Network website, or this one Wow Wow Wubsy game I used to play all the time. Now who's up for some puzzles? I managed to find two sets of these on Flashpoint, one that uses stills from the episode Bridal Gossip, and one labeled Applejack Puzzles. The Applejack Puzzles all have pictures of Fluttershy, as you do. Instead of just jigsaw puzzles, there are a few different kinds in this, one where you switch tiles around, another where you rotate rings to make a picture, and the third is this one with blocks, where you can only erase them in the formation it lets you. Reminds me of those wooden block Tetris games that you always see ads for. This one isn't much. Pinkie Pie's Cannon Blast, a simple match 3 Candy Crush style puzzle game. Match enough party favors, as indicated on the bottom of the screen, to complete each level. You can tell this one was also early because A, the hub logo, B, that off-model 2010 art. Pinkie Pie's Cupcake Maker I wasn't able to load, but it reminds me a lot of Yoshi on NES, in that you have to find the top and bottom for each cupcake. Things fall down, and you have to drag the correct frosting to the same color of cupcake to make it disappear. I guess it's different from Yoshi, because in that you can only match two things, and you can't do that thing where you have an eggshell fall down onto a bunch of items. One more puzzle game we have, Swarm of the Paris Sprites, starring Fluttershy. This one's a bust move clone with a rotating board. Guaranteed this has been done before in some other bust move style game, but it's a neat gimmick. Instead of bubbles moving down the screen, they add more after a certain time. The circle here is meant to resemble an actual swarm, or that part in the episode where they roll all the Paris Sprites up into a ball. Power-ups include a Paris Sprite which can match with any color and combine two or more colors, one that blows up all the Paris Sprites in a certain vicinity, and a golden one which I'm not sure what it does. This game's a lot of fun and low stress, so I could see myself playing again. Here's Applejack's Cake Creator, one that actually has Applejack in it. The game is based on the Canterlot wedding episode of the show. Dare I say, this is the most in-depth cake decorating simulator we've seen yet. A hot take, I know. At this point, there are only so many times I can play a matching game or decorate a cake or make up a dance routine and have something new to say about that. At least in this, they trust you with being able to stretch your cake components like you're inserting them with Photoshop. Unfortunately, you can't use any CTRL shortcuts. Here's my cake. I'm gonna put some gems because those always look delicious in the show. And what a throwback, we can even print it out. This era also brought us a dress making game with Rarity where you just click on dress components and pick a color. I couldn't play it because it wasn't available on Flashpoint. There was a site that had some games not on Flashpoint, but that wanted me to install malware. I mean, a custom browser to play them. DJ Pinkie Pie is another tie-in to the Canterlot wedding. Make a sick music video by dragging ponies, backgrounds, and effects into your timeline. If you're wondering why there's only one pony per scene in mine, the thing on Flashpoint said if I added characters to any other part of the timeline, the game would crash. So now we just have Spike dancing in a void with some confetti. Let's move on from the Canterlot wedding to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic's Season 3 Finale, Magical Mystery Cure. This episode was adapted into a Flash game called Restore the Elements of Harmony. Like the episode, you're going around as Twilight, trying to match each element of harmony to a different member of the main six. Different from the episode is how you do it. You fly around with wings that Twilight didn't get until after this episode. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. And collect shards of the elements. There are five levels, one for each other main six member. In their respective level, they can each help out by clearing obstacles. AJ bucks apples off trees, pushing shards out, RD clears clouds, Fluttershy does this thing where she tells her squirrels to go into a haystack and they find it for you, Rarity blinds the Canterlot Palace Guards, and Pinkie Pie destroys priceless Canterlot artifacts. Also, another anachronism, this is at the end of Season 3, but Discord is still stone. Clearly, they didn't read up on the lore. For shame. The gameplay itself is kind of slow and boring. The most fun I had with it was seeing which things you can hit to make Twilight do this little recoil animation. After the game's over, you get rewards, which are these little pictures you can open. Now, let's talk about a fan favorite, the Adventure Pony series. This epic duology of platformers was available on the MLP FIM section of the Hub's website. Over two games, you get to play as 12 different characters and 12 different levels. Both of these games are really cheap, a lot of browser games are, but these two are clever about it. Besides minor differences in the level layout, you're going to be playing the same level with each character, which saves on making new assets and designing new levels. 
If you're playing the game for the first time, you start off with one character and play through the whole game to unlock the next, repeat about five times, and you have the whole roster. You could argue that having to repeat the same six stages and bosses five times would artificially lengthen the game and make it boring after a while, but it doesn't really. A lot of the characters have different abilities that you get to use once you unlock them. It makes the game feel more varied. I was excited to see what each character does on my first playthrough. The presentation is a lot of fun. The 8-bit art style is obviously another way to cut development time and costs, but this was in like 2013, before the whole retro game throwback thing became overused. The death animations for the ponies are honestly really cute, they just kind of flop over when you run out of health. In the first one, you have this Intellivision synthesizer type voice introducing each level and boss. Present your pony, my little pony. Oh no, I will. Speaking of which, the bosses are another part of the game I have to mention. After beating each level, you have a boss to fight. The first one was made pretty early into the show's run, so you have iconic villains like the Hydra, a Dragon, and Gilda. Luckily, they do have Discord. The second game has a better selection of villains with characters like Trixie, King Sombra, and the Changelings. They even switch it up with how you beat the bosses in two. In the first one, you just sort of shoot at them until they lose their health, but in two, a lot of them have an extra element. The Timberwolf boss fight, you have to grab these sticks to make sure they don't respawn. Trixie starts off invincible and you need to grab the Alicorn amulet before actually attacking her. The Ursa Major and Minor, you grab these music notes to put them to sleep. And the Core 8 Eel fight, you have to lure them out in order to attack them. Although Adventure Ponies 2 has more boss variety, I think I like one more for how different the characters are. In that, there are only two ponies who share the same abilities, and the rest are different. In two, the abilities are the same for characters of each race, and there's nothing new because they're all all stolen from the first game. But now we're gonna be doing something special because I'm gonna be making the My Little Pony Adventure Ponies character tier list. Welcome everybody to, to my favorite segment. Today we're gonna be ranking every My Little Pony Adventure Ponies one and two character. They have the same engine, same gameplay, different levels, but whatever, who cares? We have the main six and then some others. Adventure Ponies 2 has like a weird roster because it's characters that aren't the main six, but it's like random, random if you go from like the main six in the first one to like people associated with them. I, like I'd imagine you'd want like the CMC, Princess Celestia and not Shining Armor and Fancy Pants. I think actually like an Alicorn character would be really fun. They should make Adventure Ponies 3. It's like like the kid who wants to make a communist country. I'm like, uh, like, if anybody ever makes Adventure Ponies 3, hint, hint. First, Applejack. I think Applejack is A for Applejack. Because she has a buck attack that can go behind her. And I think that's really unique. It reminds me of, like, a Smash Brothers move. You have to maneuver it so that you, you approach, like, the obstacles. And then you have to, like, turn around real quick so you can do the attack. And in the air, it's really fun, too. It's, like, something fun to figure out. And then Big Mac. Mmm... Yeah, let's go B tier because he has he's a he's an echo fighter of Applejack, believe it or not. Fluttershy. Fluttershy can go in I think the A tier because she's a Pegasus and she can fly. All the Pegasus characters can like bypass all of the platforming in the game. It's they're really fun. Because you don't have to like worry about falling off anything. Let me just say you do worry about falling off things, because the controls are kind of slippery. You slip off the clouds so much. If you play it for the first time, you're gonna slip off those clouds. Same for the second one, they don't have clouds, they have like balloons, but it's it's literally the same thing but a reskin of the thing. Now Fancy Pants, mm, he can go in like the C tier, because there are so many different like My Little Pony characters from FIM that I could be playing as in this game who aren't Fancy Pants. I guess there were a lot of Fancy Pants fans out there, but also all the Unicorn characters in 1 and 2 play the exact same, so I'm not a fan of that. Shining Armor, let's put him in the B tier, because we, you know, we gotta have some unicorn representation. Um, okay. And you know what, if Soren's not in here, because I forgot about him. Soren is so forgettable, you play as him in Adventure Ponies 2, but he's so forgettable that, like, I guess I didn't put him in on the tier maker list. Sorry about that, you guys. When I put out the link for this, right next to me, it's right next to me, over here, where you can go and make your own Adventure Ponies character tier list, if you want. And then yeah, Soren I guess isn't here, but Spitfire is here. Um, she can go in A tier because she has the same moves as Rainbow Dash, who is S tier. Cause the Pegasus 
their wings, they can fly. Um, and it's all, like, momentum-based. It's very satisfying to gain momentum and, like, fly with them, but it's kind of tricky the first time, because you think you can just take off, but you gotta really, like, do it slowly at first, but once you do, it's really satisfying. Fluttershy can fly, but her attack compared to these guys, her attack is kind of bad, because Fluttershy uses her stare, which can only go in front of her. Um, not the best, not the best, and these guys have, like, a dash attack. Press the space bar or hold the down key, dash into things, and it makes, like, a little trail. It's really fun to do. Um, and Soren's is the colors of the MLM flag, so happy pride, everybody. Uh, Zakora can go in A tier, because Zakora is epic. Uh, she has all the Earth Ponies play the same except for Pinkie Pie, who can go in A tier below Applejack. Pinkie Pie um, is the only Earth Pony with a projectile that is her party cannon that shoots out little uh, confetti blasts. Uh, all the other Earth Ponies have like the, the buck attack that goes behind them, but I thought it was fun to play as Pinkie Pie. All the characters in the first game, they play differently. You know, some will have the same flying ability, but some have different attacks. And then, you know, Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash can fly, but Fluttershy has her stare. And then, you know, Pinkie Pie and Applejack, they can both... The Earth Ponies climb up ladders, I guess? That's their, that's their like, special ability. Um, not an ability, really, TBH. And the Unicorns can use teleporters. Yeah, I don't... The Pegasi are the best. Twilight Sparkle, I guess she has to go in A tier. Because she's the first unicorn we get to play. I think it's... No, we get to play as Applejack, the first in Adventure Ponies 1. Uh, and now we have Rarity. Rarity can go in B tier, because she's when I realized that she has the same moves as Twilight, like everything. Twilight can shoot magic out of her horn, and so can Rarity. But they're just a reskin, and all the other characters in the first game at least have something different about them compared to the other character of their race, but Rarity is just the Echo Fighter of Twilight, so she gets in the C tier. Yeah, Soren's not on here. He's either here because he's forgettable, or up here because he's he has the, the gay flag. So we'll see about that. Uh, I'll add him to this, and then I'll put the link out in the description for this, so you can make your own Adventure Ponies character tier list. And you guys can make your own. I'll leave a link for the tier maker page for this in the description. Still surprised they never made this a trilogy. These two games were really fun time wasters. They even had commercials on the Hub Network back in the day showing these off. This is also how I found out about a few more browser games that weren't archived, like Equestrivia Challenge. The same devs who made Adventure Ponies also brought us a game called Key Crusaders around 2014. Another fun one from them, though it is based on my favorite arc from the show, so I might be a little biased in saying how much I like it. It's a simple isometric puzzler where you have to match three of these boxes and get your pony to the exit. Click on a box or your pony, then click on where you want them to go. Each of the main six has three levels, with the last making you pick up one of these keys. There is no real way to lose in this game, time limits aren't a thing, and boxes will spawn on the screen automatically which can match with the boxes on screen and clear some space. As you'd imagine though, the layouts in each level get more complicated as the game goes on. More colors of blocks show up, and different obstacles and power-ups scatter the map. Wooden crates will get in your pony's way, but match three blocks next to them and they'll disappear. Stone bricks, it's the same idea, but you're gonna have to do it three times. Matching a block with vines next to either one of these gives them a hit, but they take two matches to disappear. Wild card blocks can match with any color, but you can't combine two sets of blocks with different colors. These icons with the block symbol show up on them, and if you walk over them, they'll get rid of every block on the map with that symbol. Arrows get rid of all the blocks in that row of the field, and crystals get rid of all the blocks in a one space radius. It's really fun to make a bunch of blocks poof away with one power up, or by getting a big group of them together. You can't really make combos in a traditional sense like you do in other puzzle games, because things aren't falling on top of each other, but with the blocks popping up automatically, those can lead to combos, or even you not having to do as much work to get all the blocks out of your way. Overall, another fun time waster from these devs. I'd totally play this again if it was an actual game. Actually, if this looks like a ripoff of some actual game, shout it out in the comments. I'd love something like this. Moving on, let's talk about the fabulous Pony Creator. Customize your own pony by moving the sliders up and down. It's a simple character creator, with more options than what I was expecting it to have. Here's me if I didn't have a yak as my Sona, except the cutie mark would be like a pot sticker or something. There's also a Halloween variant, same concept but with more spooky and more costume options. I made a Hellraiser pony because why not? 
We have some more creator type games, like My Little Pony Pop Pony Maker. Despite the name, no, this isn't a game where you get to make your own Funko Pop. This is based on the pop line of ponies that you'd put together yourself. I have a couple of these and had no idea what they are when I first got them, thought they were bootlegs. Not only was the gimmick with this line being able to put the ponies together, you could also customize them. This game helps to show that with you being able to put together two of the main six into one pony, and give them all sorts of hairstyles, stickers, etc. You can even put it in a scene. And yes, print it out. Cutie Mark Magic was another gimmick from around this time, which, as you'd imagine, got a tie-in game. Here's Cutie Mark Creator, a cool concept, but they don't let you do that much with it. Pick some symbols, give them some colors, and then save. The Rainbow Power Pony Wave from 2014 and 15 had a whole bunch of tie-in games. The story behind most of these is that Discord has taken all the color in Equestria, and you need to get it back by doing random mini-games. There's one for each of the main six, so buckle up. Like some from the old hub website, these were available on both computers and phone browsers, so the controls aren't that intricate. Here's Magical Match 3, a game where you play as Twilight and match tiles together, Equestria Dash. Play as Rainbow Dash and pick up all the main six and get to the finish line within the time limit, the mouse or your finger, and you click to make her do a flip. Apparently, you can only pick up the other ponies while you do the flip, so believe it or not, this game gave me a hard time. Giddy Up Mix Up, a shell game where Applejack has to find an apple hidden under these three cups. At this point, I'm questioning what these games are doing to stop Discord. What significance does this apple have? Pinkie Pie's Party, no not that Pinkie Pie's Party. Click on colored balloons to collect them before time runs out. This little sign shows you which ones you need, and get those. If you don't, all the balloons on screen will pop. Follow Fluttershy, drop carrots to make a trail for Angel Bunny to follow and get to the finish line. Rarity's Dress Up, pick from three categories, hats, coats, and accessories, with only six things each. Press the check mark and you're done. That's all the ones in the main story. After you beat those, you get Pony Dance Party, and another one is Twilight Sparkles Kingdom Celebration, a memory game where you have 10 seconds to memorize everything on screen, then drag them to where they were. There's like one I'll always forget, or I'll drag a thing to where I know it was but it won't be there. Turns out you have to be on the exact pixel. Power Ponies Go! First Key Crusaders, Rainbow Power, and now this. We've got a lot of games based on Season 4 here. I'm not complaining though because it is my favorite season of FIM. This one's even based on one of my favorite episodes, Power Ponies. In this you go around an isometric maze collecting items to win, while avoiding enemies and collecting power-ups, like score multipliers and health pickups. On the bottom of the screen here are your abilities you can use, like tripling your points, stunning all the enemies on screen, etc. Pressing shift will let you use a special ability, which is just a thing that shoots out in front of you and stuns enemies. You have a regular attack that stuns enemies, but it's the same for each of the main six, including Spike. In the final level, you run around the Maniac's Hairspray Factory, while avoiding her and collecting parts of the reflector beam so you can finish her off. Beat the game and collect all these secret comic book pages and you unlock invincibility, which can be activated on the bottom of the screen like the others. This game's not a lot of fun, the controls are slow and sometimes not responsive, the perspective is super weird, the game just spams enemies all around you that you can't even kill, there are so many on screen that at points it just slows down. The attacks are too slow and not fun to use, neither are the specials, and the power-ups aren't satisfying to get. The best thing about the game is the art. I love the use of purple and this glowing green, and the city design from the episode itself is so fun. Same as the main six's superhero outfits. These loading screens with the glowing text are so cool. Whichever person on the dev team was doing art direction for this, you get an A+. Now, let's take a brief intermission from all these games to talk about Equestria Girls. This was a spin-off series of MLP that took the ponies into IRL. It was considerably popular and of course got some browser games based on it. First, let's look at the series of games based on the first three EG movies. Equestria Girls 1 had Dash for the Crown. This one's a 2D platformer where you travel around the school doing fetch quests and talk to different members of the main six. When they said Dash for the Crown, they meant it. Twilight moves insanely fast and jumps super high. Whenever you move, you're always at the edge of the screen. I guess they justify the speed by giving you a time limit for each level, but these controls feel like something that would be in a more action-packed game. Tasks will have you picking things up and bringing them back, but sometimes they change it up, like when you give out school spirit merch to the different cliques. The level in the gym is my favorite. You're running back and forth the same area, but by doing all the tasks, you see everything come together. A very quick and simple game. Reminds me of that one Amazing World of Gumball game where you run around the school. Also, I'm getting hints of all those licensed GBA games based 
based on Disney Channel shows. Guarantee you if EG came out in 2004, this game would be on there and would be 12 times as long, released for $30 USD, and eventually end up in that big box of miscellaneous GBA games at your local used game slash comic shop selling for like $2.99 at most. Rainbow Rocks, the second EG movie and most beloved by fans. Sorry to say, but the games for this one are just awful. First we have Battle of the Bands. A character will appear on screen with an instrument, and you have to match that to the same instrument played by one of the main six before time runs out. There's no time bonus though, just if you don't, you lose a point. For the art in this, they just use these gross doll packaging renders where they have lipstick for some reason. Except for Flash, they just use his design from the movie, which doesn't match up with the shading. It's stupidly simple, but goes on for so long, feels like one of those head-matching Learn Colors Elsagate videos, just in game form. The best part in this is a sound clip they use for when a character has a microphone, which is just taken from the live-action Equestria Girls music video. Yeah. Sounds like a transition from Hannah Montana. Oh, yeah. Repeat the beat. Another Simon game. One of the main six will play a thing, and you have to repeat it by pressing the right icon on the bottom of the screen. Still the gross packaging designs, except for DJ Pwn3 in the background here for some reason. Now, Friendship Games was the third EG movie, with the premise that it has of an academic decathlon slash athletics competition, it lends itself well to a few minigames. First, there's archery. Click on each meter when the thing here reaches yellow to fire your arrow. Each round has three targets, each of them getting s and also the meters too. No real challenge, since the meters move slowly, each character has their own power, which can make the game even easier. Fluttershy has an extra arrow, Twilight has a magnet that centers yours on the target, Sour Sweet slows down the horizontal meter, and AJ slows down the vertical meter. Sour Sweet and AJ are the best. Twilight doesn't really matter, and Flutters is the worst, she has an extra arrow so her rounds are obviously longer. The other friendship games game I managed to find is Motocross. Now this looks a lot like Excite Bike on NES, but really, this is more like Boring Bike. Choose from four characters and race over three rounds. Pick up power-ups like invincibility and speed boosts. Tokens also boost your final score at the end of the round. Like Archery, each character has their own special ability. Sunset can double jump. Rainbow Dash has a higher top speed. Indigo Zap has the best acceleration. And Sugar Coat can jump higher. Not that these have any effect on the gameplay. It's pretty slow, and there's not really any challenge to it. The final EG game for today is Fashion Photo Booth. In this, you can create your own EG character and take pictures with them in the main six. Choose from hairstyles, outfits, facial features, shoes, accessories, all that. Some of these you can only unlock by doing challenges, but at this point in my trek through every MLP game, I am not spending any more time than I need to for more options in a dress-up game. After you've dressed her up, load your girly into the photo booth where you can add main six characters, stickers, backgrounds, and even a few filters. If you don't want to make your own character from scratch, you can upload a photo from your computer to use as the face. If my Twitter account gets taken down after this video goes up, you guys will know why. Elon and Fluttershy are ready for the runway. Alright, we're back to normal ponies with another customizer game. My Little Pony, the movie, Pony Maker. Choose a body type, color, typical stuff, less pick y and more structured like a BuzzFeed quiz. Each thing you have to go down to a new page for generates your pony's name based on this Mad Lib style thing. It's all very fancy and formal, reminds me of those Facebook make your own peanuts character or Futurama head things. Once you're done, you can share it to Twitter and make pictures where your pony interacts with the main six. That last thing probably made a lot of people happy. Guardians of Harmony was released on Hasbro's website in 2017, and made in line with a series of MLP toys with action features. Yes, really, they had vehicles with missile launchers and a giant spike based on the episode Secret of My Excess. The game is an auto runner where you unlock different characters after completing a set of levels. 12 levels in total, although they don't tell you how many, just that there are 4 worlds. Changelings will block your path, and you can stomp on their heads to defeat them. You can dash once you see your pony's feet on fire. This also kills changelings. Changelings. This cockatrice comes down sometimes and turns you into stone, so watch out for him too. Collect diamonds to activate giant spike, takes out everything on screen. That's everything you do in the game, for 12 levels, each like 3 minutes, and with the same music. The stats for each pony are different, like how many points and diamonds they pick up, but the only one that really matters is health, they all control the same too. For a runner game, it's really slow. 
getting Spike isn't exciting because even without him, there's barely any challenge to the game compared to any other auto runner like Jetpack Joyride, Subway Surfers, or something where activating an invincibility power up or big thing to ride in is like a reward for staying alive. It should feel good. Here, it's just something you can do when you don't feel like pressing the same two buttons every five seconds. From the game's main menu, you can see achievements, and trust me, I'm not playing this long enough to try for any. Along with the same music for the whole game, they use the same sound clips for every character, this female grunt. As you can imagine, that doesn't work so well for the male characters. Say what you want about the Guardians of Harmony toys, but this game gives the line even more of a bad name. They really didn't know who they were marketing either of these two. My Little Pony Mini Quizzes Answer a series of questions about stuff from the show. It reminds me of this website called Quizzes that we used to use back in high school. Time to test out your brony knowledge with categories like Princesses, The Main Six, Cutie Mark Crusaders, Guardians of Harmony, and Explore Equestria. Those last two were based on separate lines, one we just talked about, and the other we'll get to when we talk about mobile games. But we're almost done with G4 browser games here, just two more to go you guys. First is Friendship Quests. This one came out really late into the show's run. We've got the School of Friendship and the Young Six here, who didn't show up until Season 8. This one is another bust -a move clone with different levels. Each level has cutscenes that describe what goes on, and they take some plots from the Season 8 and 9 episodes. Once you enter the level, you'll either have to pop enough bubbles within a time limit, or collect supplies by popping certain ones. This makes the game pretty stressful early on, as this is the only one of these browser games that has any real challenge to it. Great we get to see the student 6 in one of these, including the best character, but it's not my thing. The final browser game we're talking about in this section is Rainbow Road Trip, based on the special. This was available on mobile browsers like Safari. But the way I played it was on my PC on a browser game compilation website. Surprisingly, this is our first and only infinite jumper game out there, similar to something like Doodle Jump or Abduction. The game's story follows the specials, where this town loses its color and you need to help get it back. Collect tokens to restore color to the town, and these tokens with the townspeople's face on them will make them appear on the title screen. Rain clouds make all the tokens on the map disappear. Balloons make you float up and make you invincible. Typical infinite jumper stuff. Very easy, but there are an absurd amount of tokens needed to clear the whole game in one sitting. I knew it wouldn't be much, but I just wanted to see what happened, so I put on red letter media in the background and jumped to my heart's content. After getting 250 tokens for each main 6 member to restore their tail color, and collecting enough to fill in this meter, all you get is the full town in color and some stuff in the background. No ending screen or anything. And this is how the MLP Flash Game Dynasty ends. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. A lot of browser games usually aren't anything special. They're made to be simple experiences that kids can go and play after looking up My Little Pony games on Google. I guess since Hasbro doesn't have faith in their demographic to enjoy something like a platformer or action game, a lot of them end up being puzzles or simple activities. And those aren't bad. There's a whole generation of kids who grew up on those and played them and loved them. I mean, Girls Go Games, all those websites, etc. I know I spent a lot of time on CartoonNetwork.com trying out the newest Adventure Time or regular show games. Those didn't always have to be platformers or whatever. You know, as long as I had my favorite characters, I was good. And all this talk about nostalgic browser stuff has me thinking, why wasn't there a My Little Pony browser MMO? That would have been huge. They had a ton of browser games, so why not go to the next level? It would be crazy. Imagine Club Penguin or Animal Jam, but with ponies. Hasbro, you guys, would have made a ton off of memberships and premium currency. You could even do it like Webkins or the Club Penguin toys from the Disney store, where you could put codes in that you got off the merch for things in the game. I mean, that idea has problems. Not only would it be pretty costly to maintain, but there's also the whole thing with bronies. Still, it would have been fun though. You know what also would have been fun? A console game. Games like Key Crusaders, Adventure Ponies, even Racing is Magic are making me wish we had something like that for G4 even more now. But wait, I did say earlier in the video that there was one MLP game on an official handheld. And I guess it's time to talk about that. Now, you could argue that I've been giving a lot of these games a pass. They're really simple, with not much to them, and would be boring for anybody over the age of 9. I do agree with that a little. I'm talking about these games in the context of what they are. I don't expect a minigame collection for little kids to be anything super engaging. I just want to know if the minigames would be fun. And with that being said, for what it is, My Little Pony Math by Leapfrog is a pretty good game. 
Now, in case you don't know, Leapfrog is a company specializing in educational electronic toys and software. You may know them for this thing, or 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 by these. Starting in the 2000s, Leapfrog produced their own video game systems meant to play educational games. A lot of these were based on popular licenses, like Disney, Nickelodeon, and even Sonic X. The second generation of the Leapster, called the GS, was compatible with the LeapPad family of systems. Convenient for them that they could call this the LeapPad, when not only was it marketable based on the iPad, but also the old LeapPad, which was this thing. But I'm getting off track. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic was released for the LeapPad and Leapster GS in 2013. The game follows the main six after Discord creates evil versions of them who steal the elements of Harmony. Rarity and AJ stay behind because they aren't marketable enough, and the rest go out to stop the doubles. Despite the low resolution, the game looks pretty good. The characters and backgrounds are all on model to the show, even the UI looks good. They use that one pointy FIM font and have the pink swirly branding from the toy packaging. All the voice actors from the show recorded new lines for the cutscenes and gameplay. All the lines are in character too. It's video game dialogue like, watch out, I'm flying too low. But each of the main six have their own twist on it. It's the Leap Pad, sure, but this is technically an official console game. So I guess they did have to go all out. Now, what do you do in the game? You get to play as four ponies across six missions, with Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie having two each and the rest one. Each mission has four stages where you play four math games and one flying game. I'll spare most of the details on the math games because I know you guys don't want to hear about that. It's not just counting and simple addition, thankfully. We have probability and stuff, but that's still on a first grade level. Two, two, minus one. Oh my god, you guys, this is so hard. I'm just here for the flying part. This is the most complex out of all the minigames here. You press the A button to fill up this meter, release, then take off. You can tilt the tablet or system to go lower and pick up speed, or go higher and glide. As you can see, I couldn't really figure out how to get that on camera. The mechanic sort of operates like Mario's Cape Feather in Super Mario World, where you have to find the right balance of dipping down and catching air to keep flying. In Mario, though, you're able to go on forever. In this, I was always going down in the end, no matter the pace I was tilting the leap pad. If I had known I'd have to control it like this, I would have gotten the Leapster instead. With the Leapster, you can use the D-pad to go up and down, and the actual A button to build your takeoff meter instead of holding the button in the corner on the screen. While you're flying you can collect stars which get converted into gems which you can use to buy upgrades. The power meter here lets you do a boost and finding apples along the way will restore your meter. After you touch down you can go to rarity shop and buy upgrades. This game was fun and I'd totally enjoy it if it was a browser game or an app I could play. One of those launching style games with MLP would be really fun and the gameplay in this reminds me of those. Going back to the menu, you have achievements that you can unlock by doing certain things, like answering math questions correctly in a row, or by beating missions. Another thing we have here is micro mods. These were downloadable features that you could put onto the games on the Leap Pad by connecting it to a computer. I did try to access these, but the Leap Pad Connect program I used must have been updated in the past 8 years so that I can't get to the rewards feature. My Little Pony Math is an okay experience. I could see the learning parts being kind of interesting to someone in the target demographic, and the flying minigame works okay. Biggest problem is that I wish there was a little more to do besides that. I don't know what the standard for Leapfrog games is in terms of content or replay value, but this seems a little lacking. Like, a few more minigames and we'd be fine. For a taste of what FIM could have been on consoles, I think this is neat. I would have loved a 3DS game that looked like this. Mobile games are a lot like browser and licensed games. They don't have the best reputation, especially if you compare them to mainstream console games. I'd say mobile games get an even worse stigma than the other two. Browser games have never had to grapple with the things people say about your average iPhone game. At worst, mobile games are cheap, buggy, and designed to drain the money from you or your folks' bank account through in-app purchases. Bottom of the barrel casual games played by grandmas and other Facebook users made to get them addicted and spend even more money on premium currency and digital items. On the other hand, some mobile games can be really good. You've got the classics that most of us have grown up with, like Angry Birds, Doodle Jump, Cut the Rope, Gem Keeper, which they need to put back on the App Store. That one was so good. A fair bit of modern games don't base their design around in-app 
purchases or premium currency and let you just play. Some, you could even say, bring a console-level experience to your phone. The mobile market is big, but arguably way bigger in the 2010s. It seems like everybody had to try their hand at a mobile game. Any game company or franchise you can imagine had some sort of presence on the App Store. Even Nintendo, who only sticks to their hardware. That brings us to MLP. The first MLP games on mobile were simple interactive storybooks that would have a voice read to you. First one of these was Twilight Sparkle, Teacher for a Day. Later on, you'd get storybooks that were adaptations of the show's episodes, Power Ponies, Luna Eclipse, Stairmaster, etc. Those are notable because they're not really games, but just books with a few extra features. If we're gonna talk about MLP games on mobile, then we're gonna have to tackle the big one first. My Little Pony by Gameloft. Gameloft, you may know for games like Minion Rush, Asphalt, Spider-Man Unlimited, and a ton of others. In 2012, they put out a game based on MLP, simply called My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. For a game that old, it's got a surprising amount of updates and is still even supported to this day. There are new events and characters being added, even an active Instagram account for the game. I wonder why all that is. The game is a city builder, where you collect ponies and get to build your own Ponyville. You can expand the map to place more buildings, and even unlock different areas. Very similar to games like Dragon Vale, Cookie Run Kingdom, My Town 2, Simpsons Tapped Out, SpongeBob Moves In, buildings like shops will generate coins, or bits as they're called in the MLP universe, after a certain amount of time. Ponies live in house-type buildings, they're able to play mini-games with you, and go on missions that can help to advance story quests. Story quests are available here, these will have you doing objectives like sending your pony out to do something, buying decorations for your town, playing a certain number of mini-games, or raising your pony's level. I think that last one doesn't really do anything, besides giving you rewards when you level up, but I could be wrong. This game has so many different little modules and systems that it's really easy to get overwhelmed. Not only do you have the story quests, which are a lot. You have them in every area and they take time and cost bits. There are also group quests where you send a bunch of ponies off at a time. Most take a few days to complete. Boss fights, which I can barely understand, something about these sapphires or other currency. Decoration fusion, the pony editor, where you collect materials in order to give your ponies different outfits and thus perks, like getting more coins or XP. Collecting different shards to power up these shrines you find around Ponyville, that's the part I'm on. And the minigames? Oh my god, the minigames. They're not centralized in one area. Even on the screen that says activities, there's ones you do with the ponies, ball bounce game, flick a ball in the right direction to rack up points, apple picking, tap to move back and forth and catch apples, the constellation game, the hardest, most stressful game of connect the dots I've ever played. There's a mine at the top of your town, which lets you play an auto runner minecart game. This one is fun, but gets me sometimes, because you'll have these diamond dogs that you jump over, but during the segments where you deal with them, they'll throw in a Shadow Bolt character, and you have to suppress the instinct of jumping when you see an obstacle to take a second to look at what it is. I've slipped up so many times because of that. I jump when I see a Shadow Bolt and lose, or I take too long when it's a diamond dog and I lose. Also in that one there are power-ups, but they never spawn where you actually need them. Balloon Pop is a game you can play daily, where you tap three balloons to get items. This can be pretty useful for getting some extra bits or materials for quests. Materials also let you buy ponies. For example, I got DJ Pwn3 in my town and I needed 8 headphones to get her, so I gotta send ponies out to do things for headphones. And there's this ferris wheel thing I haven't unlocked yet, and Zakora's hut where you can make totems that give you more element shards. Hop inside this mirror and you can play the Equestria Girls dance game. It's another very 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 simple rhythm game, and I like the character models they use for this. I wish they gave you more songs, but maybe I'll unlock some if I do more stuff. There's the Golden Horseshoe Hotel, haven't unlocked it, and Find a Pair, a matching game. This game is so complex, it gets to the point where I'm wondering what you can't do in it. Basically everything in it makes you wait. Building things, getting bits from shops, doing quests, group quests, Zakora's Hut, certain minigames need to refresh even, and you can't even kill time here by doing the minigames, because those all cost bits, and you don't want to blow all your bits on the minecart game or the bouncing ball game over and over again. The only way to make the game easier and do less of the waiting is to spend your gems, this game's premium currency. If you run out of gems, then it's off to the in-app purchase store for you. You can spend real money on gems, as well as bundles where you get different ponies. Just saying right here, I'm not spending any real money on this game. If I want to spend money on a game, I'll buy a game, not pay for items I can get just by progressing and saving up my coins. Speaking of, here's my strategy that I'm using to progress in my game right now. I call it 
the five step My Little Pony Game Loft grind set. Step one, know where to spend your bits. Find one specific story quest or thing you can save up your bits for. I've only been playing for a bit, so I'm saving up to get enough expansions for all the Harmony Stones. That means I'm not going off to Sweet Apple Acres or Canterlot or spending all my bits on something I don't need. It also means I'm not spending too many bits on minigames. Speaking of... Know what your time is worth. This game wants you to watch so many ads. This guy will come by and you're gonna have to watch 81 ads to unlock him. No way. The only thing I'll watch an ad for is from here to get 1500 bits or to play a minigame for free. The minecart game is incredibly expensive, so skipping out on the bits by watching an ad to play and earn some bits or even element shards is a plus. Watching ads for gems I'm not sure about. It's only a minute of my time, but I don't think it's worth two gems every day. It's one ad per gem, not the best deal in my opinion. Watch an ad after completing a story objective that you can double your reward for, if it's a big enough reward. Don't watch ads if there's no immediate result or you have to watch multiple to unlock something. Sometimes you can either pay with gems or watch like seven ads to get something done. Don't do that. Don't watch ads for the story quests. It cuts down your time, but in the end, it's not really worth it. If you need to wait a long time for something, go watch a YouTube video or do like something in real life or I don't know. Number three, be patient. Send your ponies out on objectives that last a few hours, but that have a good time to bit ratio. For example, if a thing takes 3 hours, but you're only getting 100 bits, it's not worth it. If something takes 4 hours and gets you 500 bits, it's worth it. 1 hour should equal 100 bits. If it's more than that, then great, pick that one. Do this for all your available ponies, go do something else and come back. You should always prioritize your story quests though. If those take hours, assign your ponies to those instead because not only can you get bits, you can also get rewards like gems and especially a lot of XP. Step 4. Know which ponies are important. In the group quest screen, you can choose which ones to send out and which ones to leave behind. Since you want to prioritize story quests, don't send out any important ponies on these. The main six, Starlight, the CMC, all the main characters are needed for a lot of story things. Don't send Twilight out to do something that eager school pony could be doing instead. It's also best to send ponies out on group quests who can't do non-quest objectives. For example, if Rarity's dad can only do minigames and can't earn new bits by completing personal missions, get rid of him for a while and earn some bits. Group quests take a while, but they can earn new bits and even treasure chests. Not sure what those do, but they look nice. Number five, don't spend gems or real money if you don't need to. This kind of goes along with the be patient thing, but it's really important. If you're not paying for anything in the game, gems only come around at certain times. Don't blow them on speeding up a building or anything like that when you need to save them up to pay for things in story quests, or to buy shops that generate bits. If you couldn't tell already, I've been playing this game a lot. City building games like this are designed to get you addicted. They capitalize on that little dopamine rush that happens when you generate some bits or build a new thing. I can confidently say that I might have gotten a little addicted to it, but we'll see if I stick with it that much after I'm done playing it for this video. Or whatever I use to justify myself checking it every 5 hours. Well, um, update you guys, I did get bored of it. Um, I realized that... All, all the bits, all the gems, all the story quests, they just, they don't lead to anything major. It's designed to make you repeat the same reward cycle or whatever. You can look it up. There's probably a scientific study about it. If you have the patience and self-discipline for this type of game, knock yourself out. If you know you're going to be wasting a whole bunch of money on it, don't. I will admit they're better about in-app purchases than some other games. They have a little thing that says it costs real money which is better than the mobile games I grew up with, but you could argue that stuff like this is still predatory. Having to wait for things is a kid's worst nightmare, and making a game where one of the only things to alleviate that is by spending their parents' cash on new ponies and gems isn't a good look. There's also the point about how games like this rewire people's brains or whatever, but that's something you can look up on your own time. This video isn't a PSA, we're just talking about pony games. While looking through the app store, I found this one called MLP AR Guide. I don't know how this one works, but apparently it uses AR like Pokemon Go, or even the Gameloft MLP game. I forgot to mention that it had an AR photo mode. AR is a neat gimmick, I've never seen it used for anything super cool. Best was those old AR cards that would come with your 3DS in 2011. Here's one that's more of an experience than a game, My Little Pony Diary. 
It's a sticker book thingy where you draw and put stickers of the ponies. There are a ton of other features, but those are locked behind the paywall, or you can get the stylist to unlock stuff. I'm not buying that for this video, nor am I paying the $2 it would take to unlock all the other features. The next two apps we have both use some sort of toys to life feature. Yes, really. We have PC activity games, phone games, browser games, DS, plug and plays, leapfrog. We're diving deep into every single Gen Z gaming experience. Explore Equestria was a line of ponies that had this heart symbol on one of their legs. You could scan it using the Explore Equestria app and add it to your game. The pony you scan in acts as the host of a party. You can serve food, play a minigame, and even take a picture with the camera. I'd imagine each pony would have a different minigame, since AJ's is just bobbing for apples, a very AJ-centric game, and they'd probably want you to collect the whole bunch of them, like Skylanders or Amiibos. I think the idea with this one is that you'd have four people with four ponies, all using it on the same device. It's meant to enhance your MLP play sessions. Yeah, like this is the only thing people are using MLP toys for. If this were really meant to do that to enhance the play sessions, there'd be a notes page where you could write down all the complex lore you make up for your different ponies, and all the epic adventures they went on with your Monster High dolls and Zoobles. Honestly, it's a neat idea, but I can't imagine it working all that well with four people, and having enough ponies from this specific line. Equestria Girls only had one mobile offering, just called Equestria Girls. The game starts and we get to customize your own character by giving her a name and outfit. I saw the list of words they gave me and seized the opportunity. We're dropped in and given a map of the school. The game is mostly fetch quests around the school with some mini games, drag your finger to move and swipe up to collect gems. Gems are this game's premium currency too, but they're way easier to come by. You need them to call up one of the main six to help with missions, since certain ones are required to do certain things. You can either spend gems for this, or scan one of these medallions from an Equestria Girls doll. What I found out was that the game doesn't recognize if it's from a real thing or off a screen, so what I did was just go to Google Images and look up Equestria your girl's zap code for every character and save my gems. Which again aren't hard to come by, I can't thank them enough for making this game easy like that. The codes are cool too because it's like a visual thing. The NFC chips that most Toys to Life games use only last for a certain time, and I doubt they'd even put super well made ones into a doll, they'd probably run out after like 3 years. Speaking of, that's probably why some of your old Skylanders won't work anymore, the NFC chips have ran out. I know the clock's running out on mine, so if you guys want a Skylanders video from me, sound off in the comments because it's now or never. So back to the game. You have each girl for only 9 minutes, which doesn't really matter since you only need their help for like 5. There are 4 chapters in the game, one being the introduction, and the other 3 very loosely based on the movies. As I said, you run around, collecting things, and bringing them back to the other characters. There are also a few minigames that you play to progress in the game. In order to unlock a closed door, you have to do a memory thing with this number pad. Every so often, the game will have you test your knowledge on certain school subjects. Of course, that means you're just playing matching card games with division symbols and compasses. Heading over to these posters lets you practice for the friendship games. This is what the last chapter of the game is based around. The biking one is very similar to the browser game, but the archery one here is 2D instead of from the first person. Aim with your finger, and try to get the targets in the back. Those are worth more points. The roller derby game is pretty similar to the motocross, except you can duck down to avoid obstacles. Playing these lets you rack up a ton of coins without even noticing. I use these in the shop to give Bravestar her iconic hat and shirt. Near the end of each chapter, you'll have to prepare for the final event, measure dresses with rarity, clean off scooters for the games, and put decals on some rollerblades. After the friendship games, you're done with the main story. Supposedly there's more stuff to unlock, but I couldn't find out how. Even things in the main menu you can't do, and you get messages about having to wait. Maybe they were gonna update the game? I think it's a little too late for that at this point, so... Eh. One last thing to do is Pinkie Pie's Slumber Party. Here you play minigames like a space shooter video game, food stacker, and friendship bracelet maker. You can earn fun points, which give you coins. You're supposed to scan in an EG minifigure for this, but I couldn't find anything about that. No scan codes on Google Images, and nothing on any of the mini packaging to indicate there's anything to scan. This game was surprisingly full for what it was, only an hour or so in length. 
but it was more than what I was expecting. There were actual objectives here and a story you could do. This feels like something that would have been on the DS or even the 3DS if it were released a few years earlier. Maybe some more minigames and a way to unlock all this stuff. And you have a console level experience. A licensed DS game experience, but it's better than nothing. Downsides are that it was pretty boring at parts, and none of the minigames are that fun. It's about the same level as Pinkie Pie's Party or any of the other G3 games. While all these previous games were made by different devs, there's one studio who got the rights to MLP and made a lot, and I mean a lot of mobile games based on it. Say hello to Canadian-based Fudge Studios. These guys boast a lot of popular licenses and recognizable characters in their games. MLP, Thomas the Tank Engine, Caillou, Hello Kitty, Paw Patrol, Barbie, Smurfs, Garfield, DC Superhero Girls, the list goes on. Over a few years, they put out four separate MLP games on all mobile platforms, the most well-known being Harmony Quest, released in 2016. This game starts with a well-animated intro, the changelings invade Equestria and take the elements of Harmony. They also smash the stained glass window, which wasn't important in the show at all. I guess it's there so that they can have more than six levels in the game. Each level, you can pick a few ponies to go out and chase down a changeling who has a piece of the element or a painting. The map and premise here is based on seasons five onwards of the show, with this map that directs the ponies to a friendship problem somewhere in Equestria, but instead we're just going after these guys. Once you enter a level, you'll have to repeatedly tap the screen to make your pony move. Once you reach an obstacle, your pony stop. Here you can use one of their abilities to get past it. Twilight can lift things with magic, AJ throws apples, and Pinkie Pie just does Pinkie Pie stuff. Tap, do minigames when you get to an obstacle, repeat until the level's over, repeat for each level. Only Twilight, Fluttershy, and AJ can be played here. The rest of the main six are locked behind a paywall. Yeah, and there's no way to unlock them either. There's no need for me to use common sense media, but going on it and looking at the reviews for this game, I agree. Just make the game cost money or have a way to unlock the other ponies. The gameplay here is so simple and boring that the whole thing could just be free on a browser, but these guys expect kids to beg their parents for $10 to buy all the ponies. Say what you want about Gameloft, but at least you could get by in that without money. Also, none of these guys' games use the real voices from the show. You know what, you know you dropped the ball when the Leap Pad game has more going for it than your stuff. Color by Magic follows Twilight Sparkle as she and Spike repair the old Canterlot Museum. You, the player, do this by doing color by number things. Eventually, you can build your museum up to have multiple rooms and a ton of paintings. There's even a free draw feature. Apples are your energy, and you use one to do a drawing. And wait for the meter to refill over time. Like Harmony Quest, there are a few features locked behind a paywall. The one big thing they advertise here is the Very Important Pony Club, a subscription that unlocks more features and gives you new coloring pages every month. Five bucks a month for things in this one game? What a steal. It being a subscription rubs me the wrong way too. Like imagine it stays on someone's account after they or their child get bored of the game and it's still there, dripping money into these guys' wallets every month without them knowing. Why couldn't it at least be a one-time purchase? I bet it would be great to unlock everything for just a few dollars and maybe get rid of the ads while you're at it. In every budge game I've played, after you exit a minigame or stage or even during one, you have to watch an ad. It's only for their products, but it's still an ad I have to watch. And without my consent, too. I'd rather choose to watch an ad to get something rather than be bombarded with pop-ups when I'm done coloring baby Applejack. Rainbow Runners. Like those browser games we talked about a while back, this was made to promote the Rainbow Power Line. It even borrows the same plot with Discord. Instead here, he drains the color from everything by accident. It's a basic auto runner with multiple levels. Use each pony's special abilities like flight or magic blasts that get rid of obstacles. These abilities can be upgraded in the shop. The idea is that you're playing as all the main six, but only Fluttershy and Twilight are available. The rest you have to unlock through in-app purchases. Doesn't matter because the game is boring. There's no variety to any of the levels and they go on for what feels like forever. Also, the same problem about having to watch an ad for Miss Hollywood Vacation or Caillou Checkup or Budge World. That last one actually had MLP games on it, so of course I had to check it out. After setting up your own little planet or whatever, you get to choose from a ton of games based on Budge licenses including MLP FIM and Superhero Girls, two Lauren Faust creations. 
First one I played is this, where you fly through a storm as Twilight. It's weirdly hard, and the controls aren't easy to get a handle on. Another is this drawing game, which I actually really like. They give you actual advice on how to draw things, like breaking it up into straight lines, and different shapes. Seems like something that would help a kid who enjoys drawing. In a bold new decision for an MLP game, you get to decorate a cake. This is the longest cake decorating game I've played so far. They keep adding layers onto it, it's like comical how long this goes on for. Here's one where you play as Pinkie Pie and catch balloons. You can't line the cannon up to get more than one here, your projectile just stops after it touches the first balloon. So why are you even aiming in this? The last two are trivia games where you have to watch a video and then answer questions. This and the drawing game are the only ones on here that are educational. Despite the app marketing itself as such, this was also a subscription by the way. Budge has had some misses so far. A lot of their games felt pretty bottom of the barrel with the worst use of in-app purchases I've seen in a while. I acknowledge and understand that these guys are just humans like you and me trying to get by and make a living, but there are some better ways they could have done it in their apps. For a company that likes to talk about how kids safe they are, their games feel like they're scamming their target audience. Drawing them in with a free download and then locking the most basic content behind a paywall, these represent the worst of licensed games. Cheap, basic, boring, and just made to make a quick buck based off name recognition. That being said, they kinda turned it around a little with Pocket Ponies. Pocket Ponies is a breakout style puzzle game where you aim a bouncing projectile at groups of enemies. The projectiles here are shot out by these Pocket Pony figures which you can collect throughout the game. They even have a gotcha mechanic where you can pull a random Pocket Pony. You may recognize these models because Budge would reuse the Pocket Pony assets in the MLP games on the Budge World app. Different colored Pocket Ponies deal more damage to enemies of the same color, as well as having different special abilities they can use. By playing and collecting XP, you can level up your Pocket Ponies to make them stronger and have more health. You see, you lose health every time the enemies get too close to your characters. Restoring your character's health after they lose it, leveling up, and a lot of other things take in-game money. Like a lot of mobile games, we have our regular coins and premium currency that you buy with real money. This time around, you're able to wait or play the game regularly for it, which is good. You can even grind for XP and bits by replaying the levels without having to pay gems for everything, even more so than Gameloft. So there is a story in Pocket Ponies. In this app, Pocket Ponies exists as a game in the MLP universe, and it seems to be sweeping Equestria. Pick one of the student six, I wonder which one I chose, and travel around different locations, challenging people to games, and eventually facing off against the masters of each area. There's an overworld where you have to do fetch quests for the characters before and after each round, that just involves going into a different room and talking to a different pony and bringing something back to someone to play a match. I don't really understand in a story context how you're playing this against someone because it's a pretty one-sided game, but whatever, at least it's fun. The art direction is nice because it copies the show. The design of the pocket ponies board and all the little characters is nice. Animations are good and they even got Tara Strong to do voiceovers as Twilight for the tutorials. The UI is simple and easy to understand, unlike Gameloft which has a million things going on at once. I wish the way you manage all your pocket ponies was more intuitive. This screen looks more like a collection than one where you can level them up and see all their stats. It should have been more like the screen that pops up when you put your pocket ponies in a match, so you can see all of them and compare, and maybe have a thing where you can sort them by power level or type. At least it looks nice here. It really pushed the collectability mechanic of these. It's a very typical mobile gacha game with a fun twist on the breakout formula. It's brought down by the whole gacha premium currency pull thing, which I'm not a fan of, and the fact that you still get ads every time you exit an area or complete a match, not a fan of that either. It's a fun little game that I could see myself coming back to a few times. If only to get past the first boss. Now that I know, I can grind for XP. Since MLP made an appearance on Budge World, a non-pony specific app, who's to say they can't make an appearance on Bookful? Whatever that is. These are digital storybooks with AR elements, a few of them based on FIM. There are points you can get in this app by reading the books, but I don't think this really counts as a game. One more pony mention from a non-pony app is Zen Pinball Party on Apple Arcade. This one's a collection of pinball boards with some based on cartoons, Garfield, How to Train Your Dragon, etc. And of course, they have an MLP one. What else can I say? It's pinball. 
But is that a bad thing? Pinball boards based on shows or movies are always fun to look at, and I just love the design of them in general. They're so cool and flashy, and there's so much going on. I'd like this a lot more as a physical pinball game, but as it stands, it's okay. It's on an app, of course, so you can do some crazy things you wouldn't be able to do in real life. The ball can levitate, apple spot on screen for you to collect. If you really, really like pinball, I think you'll get a kick out of this, but that's it for mobile games. In general, I think mobile games can be fun if you know where to look. You see a lot of them now that are really dumb looking and others that are gacha games clearly meant to take your money. There are mobile games out there that are a lot of fun and worth your time that don't try to wring money out of you. Arturo, for example, is a really fun one. My Little Pony games might not be the best things on the market, but there's worse. Pretty much anything not by Budge is forgiving enough to let you just play. Nothing super out of the ordinary in terms of genre. The best two are a city building game and a puzzle game with levels and a gacha system. If these didn't have ponies in them, I would not be playing any of these. 100%. But that goes for a lot of these games. Now, the most recent generation of MLP, Generation 5, doesn't seem to have any real mobile games, despite the characters literally having cell phones in the show. There is this AR thing that's only available if you go to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. I'd consider myself pretty far away from there, so this one's gonna have to wait a bit. But speaking of G5, there's one thing I know a lot of you guys were waiting for. Recently, there's been a brand new development in MLP. Something new, yet familiar. We're gonna finally play it. The newest in My Little Pony Gaming. My Little Pony Generation 5 Browser Games. When are they gonna get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> Just to make sure I'm not missing anything for this, I did go on the current My Little Pony website, and we have some standard stuff printables, coloring pages, and some simple games. These are like DVD bonus feature tier, not even platformers or anything with any objective. I know a lot of people like to rag on G3 for its supposed lack of substance, but at least the browser games for that were something. Which My Little Pony are you? A BuzzFeed quiz type thing, where you click options that are obviously catered to a certain member of the main five, then find out which you are. I got hitch, meaning I am responsible, kind, and friendly. The name game. Another quiz where you pick one of three options, and it generates your own custom G5 pony name. I got Mave Sparkle Star. Gotta say, the animations and graphics in the name one are better than the Which Pony Are You game. That one just played animation tests between questions and used these stock renders and backgrounds. This one uses backgrounds from the movie and some animated character stills. Yeah, yeah, we're going up in quality, people. We're going up. Like Generation 4, we have another cutie mark maker. This one's more intuitive and better looking. Choose an element, choose a color, and drag it onto your board. You can adjust the size and which ones were in the front and back. At the end of it, we get some printables and wallpapers. And that's the G5 browser game experience. Nothing much, but it's worth cataloging. Browser games are definitely a dying art, so I can't see something like Adventure Ponies happening again. But now we can actually get to something cool. Nine years of G4 not getting any major console releases, G5 has been out for about one year, and we've already got a game on all major consoles and for PC. I don't know what made Hasbro decide that now was the time to make a real MLP game, but I'm happy they finally did one after all these years, even if it is for Generation 5. My Little Pony, A Maritime Bay Adventure was released for Xbox Series 1 and Series X, PS4, PS5, Windows Store, Steam, and Nintendo Switch on May 27th of this year. In the game, you play as Sunny Star Scout, who needs to help out her friends with today's Maritime Bay Day celebration. You run around, doing fetch quests, and playing a few minigames. Nothing we haven't seen before. This time, we have some actual platforming. In the beginning of the game, you play a short tutorial to get a hang of the controls. Sunny controls fine, and she walks faster than any of the G3 ponies. You even get roller skates later on to boost your speed and get around faster. The platforming here is only used to reach new areas and collect items. There's no bottomless pits, enemies, or even a health bar. All around, it's an easy game. In a surprising parallel with Friendship Gardens, you have this butterfly who follows you around and points to wherever you need to go for each quest or minigame. After the tutorial, she leads us over to Izzy, who teaches us how to unicycle things. That's the quirky G5 term for upcycling that they use, and yes, Hasbro is trying really hard to make it a thing. 
unicycling in this game lets you repair objects and earn magic bits. There's no materials needed to do it, so, you know, just do it whenever you can. There's a set number of these in each area, and collecting enough lets you unlock new items to customize Sunny. This is really neat, because after years of dress-up minigames, here's one where you can put on your own outfits and wear them as you walk around. As you head into town, you get treated to this game's main form of quest, a trading cycle. One of your friends will need a thing, then you have to talk to some pony who has it, but they want something in return. So you have to go to another pony who has the thing, go to the first pony, and then go to your friend. As you can see, we've evolved past normal fetch quests to advanced fetch quests. During the intro, Hitch tells us that we have to practice for the bunny herding contest. This one's a simple game where bunnies will run away from you and you have to chase them into a gate. It's pretty satisfying to get a whole group of them in, but there's always one I seem to miss. You do this again later in the game, except you're herding crabs too. The crabs follow you, so you have to find a way to get both into their respective gates before time runs out. Obstacles also pop up, like holes that bunnies will go into, and mud that crabs hide in. The herding mechanic you also use in the overworld for a few quests, like retrieving bunnies or crabs for people. So you have that, unicycling, and then the earth pony magic. This was introduced in the new Maker Mark special. Not only can Sunny transform into an alicorn sometimes, she also has the power to make plants grow. You can grow flowers, or in this case, a big pumpkin for one of the quests. So the game's main story. Billboards featuring all of the main five keep getting vandalized by some mysterious pony. After encountering one of these, Deputy Sprout will make you ask around to see what happened. You ask around to see what happened, and all these ponies will say that whoever did it looks like one of the main five. So, we have a mystery on our hands. Over the course of the game, unicorns and pegasi keep getting blamed for these, with Sprout going back to his whole angry mob thing from the movie, after fixing a billboard and asking around, do some more trading, and then move on to the next area. Sometimes there's gonna be something blocking your path, so it's either trading or playing a minigame to do it. I love how this game lets you explore the whole maritime bay in 3D, like it shows up in the movie. Obviously the layout isn't 100% accurate, but it's so cool to walk around like you're actually inside the movie or special. For most of it, you have a set path, but but there are one or two little areas you can sneak into. You also get to go off and see things that are going to be relevant later, like whatever this is in the town square. It's definitely not a big game. The platforming and different types of areas to explore make it feel more expansive than something like Pinkie Pie's Party for sure, but it also feels like this is just a hub world. If this were a real, real, real game, there'd be like levels here to explore that you'd go into. At points, it reminds me of the Moss Eisley Cantina from LEGO Star Wars, or the overworld from Mario Plus Rabbids. That brings me to the discussion about the game's content. For everything we get here, no, I don't think this is worth $40. We get some platforming, fetch quests, and five minigames, two of those being the same thing, just one harder. The other minigames aren't anything too special. Pip has a dancing rhythm game set to a sound-alike of the Johnny Orlando song from the movie. Zip has a flying game where you go through rings. And at the end of the game, once you solve pony racism again, you have to chase down Sprout. Let's go teach him a lesson. And that's the game. After the story's done, you can still go around and play minigames, or even collect the magic bits you missed. Getting the bits is my favorite part of the game. It's satisfying to collect every single one, and unlock more things for Sunny. The magic bits are pretty obvious when they're out in the open, but things like redoing minigames for the best score, and finding unicycling stations that you missed, adds a little replay value. These Pegasus guards who show up throughout the game will have you do speed challenges where you run through gates. This was literally the last place I looked to find the rest of the magic bits I needed, because I thought these guys were done after giving me the roller skates. After collecting every magic bit in the game, you're rewarded with the wings that Sunny can wear like when she's in her alicorn form. With that, you've done everything. For the $40 price point, again, I don't think it's worth it. For people who want an actual game, it's not a good or challenging platformer, and the minigames aren't super fun or unique. There are a lot of other actual platformers you can get for less than that on Steam, eShop, or any other digital store. For MLP fans and kids, it's a fun little experience. You get to play an actual video game with ponies in it. There are 
are objectives and things you can unlock. It's the only MLP game on a real system that has any type of platforming. You get to explore True to Life Maritime Bay from the movie, and it might even be relevant to G5's ongoing story. In this, we get Sprout's redemption arc, which wasn't a thing in the movie, all we got was him walking away here, but in this, they take his hand, make friends, all that typical pony stuff. I like it more as a Maritime Bay Day story than the special we got, even if Sprout as the antagonist is kind of redundant. I just wonder if this is even canon. The story here is being told over a movie, then a show, then a video game, 5 minute YouTube shorts with concept art that looks better than the actual thing, and a comic? It's unclear how canon these are with each other, and nothing feels definitive yet. Maybe when the show kicks off, we'll have some more stuff to go off of, and maybe G5 can have more presence on the store shelves. Have you guys been to Target or Walmart lately? These guys are like tucked in the very back of the girl's aisle, next to the leftover Trolls 2 toys, and the Spin Master Harry Potter doll line. But back to the game, did you know that people are already speedrunning this? As of writing this, the shortest any percent speedrun is by Synced Loop from Finland. In 12 minutes and 10 seconds and 90 milliseconds, wow, that really shows the dedication people have to ponies, if they're willing to cut down their time that much on a game like this. So that's every My Little Pony game I was able to play. None of these are anything special if we're talking about actual games, even the best of these don't rise above that line of actually good licensed game. But for what they are, they can be fun sometimes. A lot of them have some sort of charm, or something about them that you can look at and say, oh, that's neat, it's just ponies. They're fun and cute and playing a game with your favorite non-game characters can be fun, especially for the target audience of these. At best, they're simple games for little kids, but at worst, they're boring, confusing, or even scummy with the way they market themselves. There are a lot more games on any of these platforms that are worth your time and money, but if you like ponies, specifically of the My Little variety, see if any of these interest you. I enjoyed Friendship Gardens a little bit for the aesthetic, Pinkie Pie's Party gave me a lot of nostalgia for the days of my old black DSi, Adventure Ponies, Key Crusaders, and Swarm of the Paris Sprites were fun little browser games I wouldn't mind playing again, and Maritime Bay Adventure was a neat experience. Now, I've played almost every My Little Pony video game, but now I want to rank them from the ones I had the least fun with to the ones I enjoyed the most. Some of the browser and mobile games I'm gonna leave out, because they're too simple for me to put anywhere, but besides that, we're ranking everyone. Harmony Quest slash Rainbow Runner slash Colored by Magic, Rainbow Road Trip, Power Ponies Go, it's only here because I like the art, PC Play Pack, Guardians of Harmony, Pinkie Pie's Party Parade, Adventures in Ponyville, Grand Puzzle Venture, Dash for the Crown, MLP Game Loft, Runaway Rainbow, both versions, Racing is Magic, MLP Math, Equestria Girls, Pocket Ponies, Adventure Ponies 2 and 1 in that order, Friendship Gardens, Pinkie Pie's Party, Maritime Bay Adventure, and Key Crusaders. And with that, I want to thank everyone who managed to stick through this to the end. I put a lot into this video, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like, drop a comment down below, and subscribe. It helps support the channel and lets my videos reach more people. Click on that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new uploads. For those curious, yes, I am doing a Daughter of Discord retrospective next, so look out for that. I'll also be trying to stream more throughout the summer and into the next school year. And a special shout out to my Yaktree supporters from Patreon. Gunner Clovis, Mavis Likes Bugs, I Hate Gabby Braun with a Burning Passion, Lori Scissors, Olive, S. Arnano, Allison Madden, Alex Kincaid, Johnny Punchfist, A Kawaii Dragon, Keaton Cryer, Cascadiarch, Bad Bessie, Damian, Booth Taste, Marshmallow, Zeflo, and Goose Nerd. I can't think of a better outro, so until next time, goodbye. Sure.